Thank you for joining us to discuss Volition's new QVET commercial strategy. Uh, the team's prepared a video presentation that we'll share shortly. Then we'll follow that up with Q&A with Dr. Tom Butera, Volition Veterinary CEO, and Gael Forter, Volition's Chief Commercial Officer. If you have any questions during the presentation, please feel free to submit them through the Q&A tab at the bottom of the Zoom panel. We'll try to do our best to address them all. Without further ado, let's get started. Thank you, Sue, and good morning, everyone. We're here to uh, discuss Volition RX. Um, I'm Gael Forter, the Chief Commercial Officer. It's a pleasure to have you this morning. So uh, first of all, who we are, we are Volition, an epigenetic company focusing on epigenetic markers. Epigenetic means on top of the genome. We have two core use cases, if you will, on the human and the animal space. Currently, it is on screening as well as monitoring for disease progression and treatment response. We believe our addressable market is very significant in the billions. And in the short term, commercially, we have two key product area that you know, are either on the market or about to come on the market. The first one is the vet cancer screening and monitoring test that you'll see, as well as then upcoming netosis. And on the human side, we have our netosis program and assay coming. We just started to monetize our IP uh, with major agreements uh, that we'll discuss further with both the HESCA Corporation and IDEX. What set us apart today? We have, as I mentioned, a large IP portfolio, 128 patent pending, more than 90 already granted. Uh, we're working on, on a lot of breakthrough technology. Uh, it's a growing patent portfolio. Uh, and that allows us to offer our current test in a simple, low-cost, accessible format. And we think this is a core competitive advantage. So we are Volition, the company, the brand, but we also have now a commercial brand. We have NuQ for nucleosome quantification. So in terms of product pillars, internally, we are working on the application of this technology to the vet space, to the netosis space, that's NuQ net, cancer oncology, capture and discover. So commercially, our two key focus area currently are NuQ vet and NuQ net. I'll continue on EQNET in a little while, but for now, I want to hand it over to Heather and Tom. We'll update you on the VET opportunity. Hi, my name's Heather Wilson Robles. I'm a medical oncologist by trade, and I'm the chief medical officer for Volition Veterinary. And today, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the science behind our technology, as well as its clinical uses and our ability to detect it uh, with a variety of important diseases. Nucleosomes are the, really the basic building blocks of our chromosomes. And so really the way nucleosomes work is you have eight histone proteins and they sort of make up a core, really a spool, which round the thread of your DNA is wrapped. Those get further condensed and actually make up the scaffolding, which is what builds the DNA around your chromosomes. Now what happens is during cell death or during necrosis or even during inflammation when you have a lot of a neutrophilic action, is those nucleosomes get released out of the nucleus of the cell and into the blood, into the plasma. And really that's what we're detecting. So we are looking for the amount of nucleosomes that are sitting in the plasma at any given time. We all have some because our cells are constantly turning over in our bodies, except it's usually a very, very low amount. However, in certain states like cancer or sepsis or, or severe inflammation, we find that the body's ability to get rid of those things is hampered. We've sort of maxed out above that, almost like a sink getting too full. And so what ends up happening is those nucleosomes rise in your blood. And when they do that, our test, a very simple ELISA test, is able to detect and quantify the number of nucleosomes floating in the blood. And we have found that to be an important detection tool for both cancer and inflammation. Lymphoma is the most common cancer that we diagnose in pet dogs. It represents anywhere between about 20 to 25 percent of the cancers that we see. There are quite a few different types of lymphoma, but really the most important types are B cell and T cell lymphomas. Uh, B cell lymphomas represent about 70 percent of the lymphomas that we see, and our test was able to detect 95 percent of those in one study that we published. 
T cell lymphomas make up, again, about the other sort of third, and we were able to detect over half of those in the study that we did. Lymphoma is not a curable disease in dogs. However, it is one of the most treatable diseases that we use. 85% of our dogs will go into remission when treated with chemotherapy, and our ability to monitor that may actually be an important key use for NUCU in the future. Hemangiosarcoma is also another very common cancer in dogs. Actually, together with lymphoma, they make up over one-third of the cancers that we see. This tumor frequently affects the spleen and often arises silently with no clinical signs until the time where dogs actually have a bleeding event, putting them in shock and actually requiring an emergency vet visit. Our test has the ability to detect hemangiosarcoma even at the very early stages before a bleeding event happens. We're able to detect 82% of hemangiosarcomas in dogs, over 60% of those dogs with early stage disease. Cancers like lymphoma and hemangio are systemic cancers. This is where our test performs the best. Other systemic cancers like histiocytic sarcoma, we're able to pick up over half of those. Metastatic carcinomas and things like that have all been tumor types that we are successfully able to detect with this test. Adding the new Q test to a wellness or a prevention plan for our pet dogs starting really at middle age, so probably seven, eight, nine years old for these guys, as well as earlier in those dogs who are at risk, dogs like golden retrievers, rottweilers, boxers, Bernese mountain dogs, really probably starting to test those guys around four years of age as part of their wellness test plan makes really good sense. Welcome everyone to our webinar today. I'm Dr. Tom Butera, the CEO of Volition Veterinary, and I wanted to just let everyone know that our mission continues to be and will always continue to be to save lives on the pets as well as the humans that we interact with on a daily, monthly, and annual basis. I wanted to give you a little bit of information about the tremendous opportunity we have in the veterinary space to introduce our new Q vet cancer screening tests to our veterinary colleagues on a worldwide basis. Just to give you a consolidated view just on the United States alone, we have 84 million dogs. Of those 84 million dogs, we have more than 6 million of them develop cancer on an annual basis. One out of every four dogs develops cancer. 50% of dogs over the age of 10 develop cancer and die of cancer. Of the 84 million dogs that I mentioned to you, over 50% of them are dogs that are over seven years of age. Our test initially addresses all dogs over the age of seven years of age should be tested. That's close to a 42 million dog population that potentially could be an opportunity for us to screen on an annual basis. In addition to that, we have a recommendation is there is a host of breeds that are also predisposed to cancer and we are recommending that they be tested as early as three to four years of age. So I think you can get a little bit of a taste of what the tremendous opportunity is for our test just on a screening basis alone in the United States. I know I gave you a lot of numbers, but those numbers are really the introduction to what I want to speak to now. How are we going to address this commercial opportunity? First of all, we want to have worldwide distribution of our test accessible to every veterinary community in every country in every part of this globe. That's not something that Volition Veterinary and Volition itself has the capabilities of doing by ourselves. We have to have significant reliance on major corporate players in the space around the world. Our goal in particular at Volition Veterinary and I'm sure it's also the case with Volition is to continue to produce phenomenal products from an R&D perspective to provide the scientific basis for those and also to bring them to commercialization as quickly as we can to, in order to allow the partnerships and the distribution channels that we are building with major corporate players around the world and have them provide the access to the veterinary communities on a worldwide basis. So now let me give you some specifics on some of the major deals and partnerships that we have developed in 2022. The first major partner that we signed a $28 million deal with is the Hesca Corporation. That was an exclusive arrangement for point of care testing and if anybody wants to know what point of care testing is, that means it's an in-house piece of equipment 
that specifically goes in the veterinary hospital where the veterinarians and the veterinary technicians can access that blood work from the pet in the hospital and provide an answer within 10 to 15 minutes to that client. In addition, with HESCA, we also have a non-exclusive arrangement with them to source their contacts both in the United States as well as in Europe and in other parts of the world where they have contacts with other reference labs. The other most recent announcement that we have, which we are absolutely excited about, as well as the HESCA, is we just signed an agreement with the IDEX Corporation, which is a worldwide distributor in reference labs to veterinarians around the world. To give you a little bit of an idea of how large this company is, we are talking about 80 reference labs around the world servicing 50,000 veterinary hospitals. Being able to access through IDEX reference labs, which is a non-exclusive arrangement, the opportunity is immense and the contacts and the exposure that we will have with our test is uh, something that we have been working on for an extended period of time and we just announced it at the VMX Orlando conference in January 2023. So where are we now? We're launched in the IDEX reference lab. We are launched at HESCA. We're launched at the Texas GI lab. Skill, which is that other portion that HESCA has a significant footprint in Europe with, as well as DNA Tech in Portugal, which is the largest veterinary reference lab in Portugal. Coming up, as I mentioned earlier, we have an exclusive agreement with HESCA on the point of care unit in veterinary hospitals. That point of care unit should be available for launch and distribution sometime in the first half of 2023. The other claim that's coming out soon is the monitoring claim. That is a paper that is currently being reviewed by our peers, and that specifically identifies the use of our test for monitoring disease progression in animals and in remission. So it's a highly useful test where the veterinarians that treat animals for cancer can monitor how they are progressing, how they are responding to treatments, and then when they are into remission. And in addition to that, when they go back to the general practitioner, they can use our test for monitoring how long that animal stays in remission and when potentially it may return. Let's look into the future a little bit about all the exciting things that Volition Veterinary is currently working on over the course of the next 12 to 24 months. We are currently doing a lot of pre-analytic work in cats to substantiate our new Q platform in cats for cancer and then eventually for non-cancer aspects. We're also working on introducing netosis to the companion animal side. We have hired over the last six months a veterinary criticalist at Texas A&M University, uh, Dr. Justin Hines, who actually is leading our netosis uh, educational pursuits and clinical trials in the U.S. and is also working with collaborations in Europe as well on this important topic. I know Gail has spoken to it already, so stay tuned. We are also investigating this year the use of our new Q platform in horses, especially elite equestrian horses for performance, and also another significant opportunity for us is production animals, where we are looking specifically at particular diseases where our new Q platform could potentially really enhance at a low cost basis, identifying specific diseases that are very prevalent in production animals, and we're working on that as well in terms of pre-analytics in 2023. I'll end with, we have a significant number of collaborations that we have developed both in the U.S., academic institutions in the U.S., as well as collaborations with uh, universities in Europe, in several different countries, which are extremely interested in the products that we are bringing to market. And we couldn't be more excited about the scientific support that we are getting from communities both in the U.S. as well as in Europe. With that all said, uh, thank you again for joining us today, and I'm going to pass it back over to Gail. Thank you, Tom. A lot of excitement on the vet side and a great start of the year. So now, quickly on Netosis, and um, if there are a lot of questions or interests, we are, we're happy to run a dedicated webinar. But why, why is it an interest for Volition? So Netosis, it's a unique form of cell death characterized by the release of decondensed chromatin. So now you can see it is linked to what we already doing previously. We decided to focus initially on some big indications, sepsis, coagulation, thrombosis, as well as transplantation. And within those indications, restratification, 
treatment and monitoring of remission. And it's already a very significant market opportunity. So the time for sepsis, again, is very sizable. Just to give you a couple numbers, in the US alone, 1.7 million adults every year have sepsis. It's present in a very large number of hospitalizations. And in terms of thrombosis, again, and because it's, it's monitoring, you know, we're talking about multiple tests at regular intervals. Quick update uh, on the netosis opportunity. So in May 2022, we got granted a first C mark. We also have our FDA program uh, that is progressing, no on the way. We started in Q4 to the work to support our uh, breakthrough device designation application, as well as a broader netosis FDA application in the first part of 2023. We also have a clinical study signed in collaboration with MD Anderson on sepsis in cancer patients. So you can see a lot of synergies with the work we're doing, both on oncology as well as netosis. In terms of a commercial update, so we discuss the idea of centers of excellence, specific locations with other key uh, opinion leaders or you know, teams of a very high caliber running or tests and those centers of excellence, we're happy to, to announce that already two are fully operational and we're in discussion to add more. And, and you'll see uh, this number growing significantly, uh, both in Europe and as well as in the US. Um, we also have ongoing discussion for licensing and supply uh, agreements with major actors of both the coagulation space as well as the, the sepsis uh, market. So now quickly, in summary, I want to make sure you leave with a couple of key points. So first, we are a diagnostic company focusing on epigenetic, which is an exciting area uh, where a lot of large players now are, are drawn to. Um, we have both a human and veterinary uh, applications, and our initial focus is on screening and monitoring for uh, what we think are life-altering disease. We believe our addressable market, just on those first two uh, key areas, is very significant in the billions. We can be a big company just succeeding on those two, two points. But we work on more, but those two will, will make us a, potentially a, a significant company. Those are the two areas that we will focus initially commercially for, I would say, the forcing future, 22, 23, possibly even 24. Um, and we have a, a, a number of updates uh, that hopefully will, uh, will interest all shareholders uh, over the next uh, month and, and quarters. And finally, we just started to monetize this IP. And this is what I mentioned. We're like, those are the two first key areas of interest for us. But there's a lot more. We're happy to now answer any questions you may have. Back to you, Sue. Thank you for that presentation. Again, if you have any questions, please submit them via your Q&A tab at the bottom of your Zoom menu. Uh, we do have a few questions already, so let's get started. Um, Volition presented at the VMX following the big announcement with IDEX. How did the conference go? Well, I'll handle that one, I think, Sue, for you. Uh, the conference was, uh, the VMX conference is the largest veterinary conference in the world. Uh, there was an attendance of over 26,000 people from the veterinary community there. The largest conference attendance prior to this one was 19,000. It gives you a little bit of a taste of uh, the exposure that we got there. The, uh, the really four phases of it. Uh, the first phase, we had Dr. Sue Ettinger, who's our AKA cancer vet, spoke on the UQ platform. We had hundreds of veterinarians attending her lecture and uh, they were uh, overly impressed with our UQ platform and with the availability of the test uh, on, uh, uh, with the partners that we have with us. Obviously the other part of it, IDEX, uh, our new partner IDEX, ran twice a day teachings about their preventive care program and NUQ in particular, in terms of where that fits into their program. And those were very well attended. Uh, they were presented by Dr. Andy Plum twice a day. Um, HESCA had a separate uh, area and a landing area at their booth where they had an element I, which is that point of care unit, which we talked about in the video, uh, where, and they had heavy traffic there where many veterinarians and vet techs were coming to see that. And finally, at our veterinary booth, which was manned by a veterinary team, and we brought the entire veterinary team because we anticipated having a tremendous 
uh, tremendous traffic flow, we had three times, three times the number of people attending the booth and asking questions and inquiring about our test. Great conference. Yeah, that sounds great. Uh so refer reference labs such as IDEX dominate the diagnostic space. Will that be your focus area as well? Or are you looking to differentiate more emphasis on the point of care side? Great question, Sue. Um, first of all, we, we like to consider ourselves as an agnostic company, both in terms of our platform and in terms of our test itself. We really want this to be a test that is absolutely accessible to every veterinarian around the world. So if you think about that, our, our intent is to obviously gain distribution channels, sign licensing and supply distribution channels with great partners like we have with IDEX and with HESCA around the world so that we can formulate and keep to that mission of offering this test to all the veterinary communities out there and obviously to the pets and to the pet owners that take care of their pets. Maybe. I can add just a, a few words. Um, if you notice during presentation, we talk about trying to be low capex for partners and clients. And part of it is making sure they don't have to change completely uh, their workflow and, and, uh, and you know, adopt new technology. So part of that is you know, implementing and test on as many platforms uh, as possible. So um, here, here's another one. Uh, will the pricing for new Q be similar in reference labs and in the point of care setting? Gail, I'll let you take that one. Yeah, so obviously we don't control the price uh, that our partners are charging. Um, we try to find an equilibrium where we think it's fair for every player, you know, the POC, the reference lab. And so we foster a, you know, a healthy ecosystems. If, we, if everyone wins in the end and we become the uh, the marker of reference for for the indications that we are we're implementing, uh, that's where we would be successful. So um, I can't speak of a specific of the pricing, but we 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 structure uh, our deals in a way where uh, all the players have a, a an equal or a fair shot at uh, at succeeding. Okay. Um... In terms of volume, how do you expect the mix between the volumes from reference labs and point of care to evolve from this year, say five years down the road? Maybe. Well, to give you, yeah, I'll take, I take that and you can add to it if I uh, should happen to miss something. Uh, typically from the veterinary perspective, uh, pretty close to 80% of the uh, diagnostic work that's done outside of the veterinary clinic, meaning through the reference labs, is, is shipped off to reference labs from the veterinarians. And about 20% of it is done in-house in terms of diagnostic equipment that's in the, uh, in the veterinary lab itself. So that's kind of the ratio that's there. We also anticipate because of the point of care unit that's also going to be offered and the awareness that we're gonna be creating by uh, the reference lab exposure with the great partners with IDEX and HESCA that we have, that's probably going to uptick the number of point of cares that will eventually come to market as well and probably will uh, incline that number to be potentially higher uh, because of that awareness. It's interesting enough, many of the veterinarians that we interviewed during our uh, our Dr. Sue, uh, Dr. Sue Ettinger presentation said, you know, they're going to do both. They're going to use the reference lab and the point of care. And we, we anticipate that that's going to be something that's going to be quite exciting for the community. Gail, I don't know if you want to add anything else to that. Nothing to add, Tom. So uh, here's another one. Congrats to you all. Thanks for your hard work. Do you see a need to bring in additional distribution partners in the U.S. related to what percentage of the market do you think is covered now in the U.S. with HESCA and IDEX signed? We, we are certainly working with additional distribution partners. HESCA probably has close to about 15 percent of the market in the United States. Uh, IDEX has probably close to about 50 to 51% of the market in the United States. There are other potential opportunities for us, which obviously we are in discussions with all of them, both domestically as well as in Europe. So that's, you know, uh, we have broad coverage in the U.S. right now, but we're obviously looking to gain a complete coverage over a period of time through additional distribution channels and partners. I may just add that I think at this stage, we're probably covering 90% of the, uh, the vets in the US. So we think we already have a good coverage, but that doesn't mean we'll, we'll stop there. Um, 
we, we have a lot of questions here. So here, here's another one. Uh, we just heard that the canine test is already available in the US and the global rollout is expected in the coming months. Can you discuss your plans and expected timelines for the rollout for the feline tests as well as for monitoring? Yeah, I'll answer the, uh, the monitoring question. We're actually in the process of submitting uh, currently for peer review our monitoring paper. And I spoke a little bit about that on the video. So that we're very excited about that. And we anticipate that hopefully uh, we will be able to have that monitoring paper out and have that claim approved uh, by the latter part of the first half of 2023. With reference to cats, we're extremely excited about cats. I mean, that's a whole nother element. In the United States alone, I think there's close to 100 million cats. And uh, consequently, we're currently working on the pre-analytic studies in cats at Texas A&M University and in collaboration with other universities. So we anticipate um, working through all those pre-analytics in 2023 and uh, making advancements uh, in offering our cancer screening to cats as well. How about, uh, can you can you address the expected speed of product rollout for both HESCA and IDEX and what will the run rate be by year end? And then also, uh, do you anticipate IDEX will launch in Europe and Asia? So those are two parts. So okay, I'll let you start. Yeah, I can start with uh, launching in, uh, in Asia and Europe, yes, for both partners. Um, as well as you know this, we also signed with DNA Tech in Portugal, and we have other partners that we're discussing in Europe. And what was the, uh, the first part of the question? So, uh, the, the first one, yeah. Oh, the speed and the, yeah. the production. So, we, we're, we are not ready to uh, share projections uh, with the street. We're, we're very excited by the qualitative that we're seeing and the quantitative that is, uh, is about to come. Uh, but currently, what we're expecting is, is a, a strong pickup. We are seeing a lot of interest, uh, but we're, we're not uh, yet ready to share uh, precise numbers. We do anticipate to be in, uh, in, in Europe, uh, potentially with IDEX, hopefully, you know, in some time in 2023. At least that's the hope. And um, they obviously have a pretty expansive bandwidth in Europe as well. Yeah. Okay. Um, and, and the last point, maybe at scale, I think uh, because we're, we're thinking, you know, so years down the line, both partners are very excited about what the potential of the product at scale. So, um, you know, the ramp up is one thing, but also I think the, uh, the eyes on the prize is what can it be in five or 10 years? It's, it's uh, uh, very possible to be uh, one of the, 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 the major products out there on the vet space. Okay, how about um, maybe uh, on the vet diagnostic market in Europe and Asia, in terms of ref lab and point of care players, are, are they just as consolidated as the US? No, it's, it's, a, it's a more fragmented market uh, for sure. And uh, there's obviously more opportunity for more players. Skill has a pretty strong uh, footprint, uh, which is owned by HESCA has a pretty strong footprint in Europe. And obviously IDEX has a strong footprint in Europe, but it is a more fragmented market than the US. And maybe to that as a follow-up, maybe um, will the, the price points be different between the uh, reference labs and the point of care setting labs? So yeah. I think we, we answer uh, maybe some of that question earlier is yep. the way we structure the transaction is uh, we found an equilibrium where it's a, it's a you know, fair price for both parties. Then after that, you know, HESCA, IDEX, and any other distributor uh, will sell it at the price that they determine, and then the vet will have its markup. So that we don't control. Obviously, we work with our partners to educate and try to figure out what is the, the, the price points that will maximize uh, the volume. But uh, as of today, uh, you know, we, we create an equilibrium and we're very happy with that. As far as the retail price, uh, this is something that individual vets and uh, uh, the, uh, both partners are uh, you know, at full discretion on. Okay, uh, here's another one. Um, the second biggest player Mars is missing to have big coverage. What are your plans to get them on board? All I can say is we're in active discussions with all of them, Sue. So if you think about worldwide distribution, it requires discussions with all. Okay. Uh, have you considered any marketing campaigns to drive awareness at the consumer level? We are actually at, at uh, 
through the partnerships that obviously we've established already with uh, Heska and with IDEX, they're obviously going to indirectly be uh, starting to uh, expose to the consumer. We at Volition Veterinary are starting to uh, engage in outreach programs to consumers. We're in the process of doing that and we'll be doing it during the first half of 2023. Just so you know, it was very important for us to make sure that we educated the, the doctors and the oncologists both domestically and in Europe. And we made great advancements with that so that they knew about our tests because they're the ones at the end of the day that are gonna run it and want it. Now we are just beginning to pivot to the consumer and that probably will bring in a whole nother layer of interest on using our tests, but the veterinarians will know about it, which will just accelerate hopefully the uptick of the test. Maybe one last one on the vet side. Uh, are, are the vet tests produced in Silver One? So all our key components are produced in Silver One. And then after that, the assembly uh, is depending on the contracts that we have uh, in different locations or at Silver One. Okay. So um, uh, just, just to remind everyone, feel free to submit a question through your Zoom toolbar at the bottom. Uh, but in the interim, maybe we'll just um, do a couple of NETS questions. Sorry, we didn't get to discuss much of NETS today, but here, here are a couple. Um, could you provide an update on the progress made in approaching the FDA for breakthrough device designation for new QSA? And what would the designation mean in terms of the new Q development plan? So we, we're we working uh, toward that. We're actually uh, waiting for some data that is gonna uh, uh, help us with the uh, BDD uh, breakthrough device designation uh, submission that we are going to, um, to, to uh, submit in the, in the next few months. So stay tuned for that. We, we can't speak too much about that uh, in details today, but uh, you'll see more news soon. Okay. All right, so here's another one. Um, and uh, what um, and maybe just one thing you you ask or so about what it means in terms of speed. So um, okay. it's it's more streamlined, more collaborative with the FDA, um, and and you know hopefully that allow us to have a, a slightly accelerated or an accelerated timeline with them. Okay, so there's been some. Uh, encouraging clinical data sets demonstrating importance proof of concept for new Q essay detection. Uh, could you provide an overview on some of the key results and what this means for clinicians and patients? So today we're, that, that's the, 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 the big part of the, one of the big parts of the work that we're doing on Etosis. So maybe it's worth doing a little bit of a, take a step back. So on Etosis, we work on the platform, the KOL, the publication, you know, the clinical indication, we work on the regulatory side and with commercial partners. So all of those points are currently engaged and we're actively working on this. On the KOL publication and clinical indications, so we have currently, and, and uh, I wanna make sure I'm, I'm saying it correctly, but you know, we have correlation with the SOFA score. Uh, we got a, a paper published on this and we were very happy with the, the result there. Uh, SOFA means sequential organ failure assessment. And uh, so that's a, a first interesting uh, publication, but obviously we have more coming. Uh, that is the goal of the centers of excellence that we discussed. We have two already onboarded, uh, more that we are going to onboard soon, and we expect data coming out of those during the year, uh, and that will help us with clinical, uh, uh, you know, um, and and regulatory work that that you'll hear uh, going forward. Okay. Um, how about? You know, thank you for being patient and, and answering all these. Here's another one. Right. Uh, and what are your plans for the new QNet commercial strategy? Will it follow in a similar model to BET and work through licensing and supply models? Yes, very much. I think we like this model. It works for us uh, very well. You know, we there are parts where we're very good. We're very good on R&D. We're very good on the education to the market, you know, uh, finding KOLs, they're excited by, by what we're doing and bringing them on board. So this would definitely uh, be something that we, we uh, work on the same. And actually you've seen it already. Uh, we joined the ISF, uh, International Sepsis Forum. Uh, we have some uh, KOLs out of that that are already working with us. So very similar in that front. In terms of pure commercial, um, there might be some tweaks. Obviously the human space is different, more more regulatory work to be uh, to be done, but the same model of low capex 
We want to make sure for clinicians, it's going to be something that is easy to adopt uh, and low OPEX for us in a sense where we're going to leverage the, the network, the experience, the work uh, that those partners uh, have done and, uh, and help us with the distribution. So yes, very much. Okay, how about this last one here? Uh, could you expand on the nature of the commercial efforts with the two centers of excellence for Natusis? Is it actually expected to be a revenue generator or more of a, uh, to gain familiarity in the tests among KOLs in anti anticipation for the FDA registration readout? Oh, it's a good question. It really depends. Some uh, centers, and uh, I'm thinking of one in particular, uh, as soon as they finalize the paper, uh, we'll, uh, and, and assuming they're happy with it, which we expect, uh, we'll enter into routine work. So yes, it will be revenue generators. Others uh, are more just for publication. They don't really have a, a large patient base that would justify really moving into uh, the same uh, uh, commercial or adopting uh, uh, the, the platform. But yes, uh, very much some centers of excellence will become actually uh, sizable customers for us. I think that's really all the, the time we have for questions today. Um, if, if anyone has any questions uh, for the management team or would like a one-on-one, -on -one, please reach out to the Volition Investor team listed at the uh, bottom of the company's press release. Thank you everyone for joining today. Thank, Thank you, you, Sue. Thank you everyone.